Okay, I finally read the message that you, I muted. Okay, thanks guys. All I was saying was that, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I have a checklist and I check that the uh, mics are turned on before I started. I checked the one on my belt, but I forgot to check the one on the computer. Anyway, I was just saying I was brewing Shupuar, which I guess wouldn't surprise a lot of you if you uh, follow the channel or follow my uh, habits. I gotta, to have a good night's sleep, I gotta have pretty much Shupuar at this hour of the evening. I'm brewing these coins. I'm just kind of repeating what I was muted for a minute ago, which easily break in half, which you saw but didn't hear. They come in a nice little sleeve of 10. Uh, a really great tea. Yes, thank you for the, uh, no, it's not just you, everybody, all the sound comments. I should have noticed when the comments went crazy, I should have double checked my sound. So yay, 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 I see lots of good stuff at the bottom. Okay, that's a good icebreaker for me. I was a little bit nervous, I messed up the sound. Now I can mess up whatever I need to. We're gonna have a good night tonight, guys, all right. Mich uh, Michelle Sheshtak, hey, welcome. Welcome, Cindy, Brandon, Eric, everybody cool and nobody could hear anything now everybody can hear everything that's awesome so <laughs> excellent and i was just saying also i'm going to be just taking the easy road tonight brew it in a simple sort of travel mug with a filter built in kind of thing so i can manage the presentation and all the other technical stuff and not have to worry about brewing tea at the same time it's just me tonight so you guys get some uh some time with me with sound so yay and uh, I guess without, without further ado, let's get rolling with the presentation with uh, exploring the world of Chinese tea. All right. So I'm gonna hang out down here, guys. I'll still be with you. I might come in, fade in and out, just uh, if depending on what the slide is. So uh, as most of you know, I'm Phil from Gen T. So I didn't even start by introducing myself. I'm Phil from Gen T though, and. Um, what we're all about is bringing you guys tasting grade, uh, delicious tasting grade Chinese tea. And uh, I'm gonna, I've done this talk before, I'm gonna bring it to you guys tonight. I've really missed being able to get out there and do festivals or just to get out and see you guys in person. So I thought this is sort of the 2020 version of the same to uh, just hang out, have some tea together, have a little talk together. So um, this talk is um, for people who are getting into Chinese tea and want to know more about it, or for people who are into Chinese tea, I'm going to cover some things probably from a bit of a different angle. Should still be super interesting for you guys as well. We're going to touch on, in this uh, one presentation, we're going to touch on just about everything, okay? Um, in many cases, we have other videos that go more in depth on this stuff we'll be talking about tonight. And um, I will either point that out as we go, or uh, it'll be, I'll have links down in the description. So if there's something that it kind of piqued your interest, you can always check down there later to see if there's um, more videos on it. Certainly like tea processing and stuff like that. We've got a couple great videos on that. So, um, so tonight we're gonna cover stuff like that, like processing, we're gonna touch on history. I don't know about you guys, but as an engineer, I was never a huge fan of history. I've kind of grown to really appreciate it now, but it's just sort of a touch just to give you a feel for um, sort of the, the importance of it vis-a-vis -vis Chinese tea, um, brewing vessels, tea categories, health, a little bit of everything. Um, check out on our website, there's a, a blog posts, not just on our channel, like I mentioned, we have videos on the channel, but we also have blog posts about a lot of these topics that are really um, interesting and also go a little more in depth. And um, Cha Ren Magazine, also available through our website, is also a great spot where we go really really in depth uh, in that format it's more like a like a very detailed very sort of intimate and you know i guess technical in some cases too so um, they're all under t learning on our website so check that out and um if you're just stumbled across this uh, and you're you're not familiar with anything that we do um and you're wondering why would anybody be so intensely interested in tea and get and having a whole like presentation on it it's just after all a great beverage right well the reason is is um and a lot of you guys might know this already but tea is actually more complex than uh wine so obviously there's a huge amount of people who do wine tasting and get right into wine tea is actually a more chemically more complicated beverage uh, arguably process wise maybe i don't know that much about wine processing but 
It's got such a range of flavor from just one single plant, one leaf. Um, so that's why we're so into this, why all of us teenagers are so excited about this uh, kind of stuff. So let's have a, a word about participation. You guys already have the right idea. When I came in with no sound, bing, the thing lit up. Sound, sound, you're muted. Perfect. Okay, guys, I really want to, um, I want to have an engaging presentation or engaging time with you guys tonight. Um, just blurt out questions or comments in the, uh, in the, uh, in, on the, in the chat there and I'll be, I can see it. So I'll be keeping my eye on it. I guess a little bit more closely now since, uh, <laughs> since who knows what could go wrong. When you guys are on the ball, keeping me, uh, keeping me, uh, keeping me alive. So definitely any questions, shoot them up. And I'm also going to be asking you guys a few questions. So please, uh, every now and then when I shoot out the question, just shoot out some answers. Don't leave me with the crickets. It'll, it'll just, uh, it'll just be more fun like that. All right. So, uh, yeah, let's do it. So tea is the bomb. A lot of you already know that, right? Fine food is awesome. Fine wine, fine whiskey. These are all great. I love them all. But tea, like I said, one plant, so many flavors, so many sensations that transcend flavor happening in your mouth, nose and throat. There is nothing like tea, nothing at all. So what you see here is the tea plant. And I just thought it was nice to start with seeing what the leaf looks like. It's quite different than what we tend to see in our, um, unless you're like me and you get right into it and you unroll them, a little different than what you usually see in your uh, gaiwan or your teacup. Uh, they can be quite small buds, which I don't, which we don't see here. And they can be quite large, um, like the lower down on the plant. Your sound is on. It's all good. It's all good now, yeah. So Jen just came in to double check on the sound. So that's great. I guess somebody hit her on Instagram. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, yeah, so it can be large. They can even be like as big as your hand and on some of the different cultivars. And it's interesting. One of the things I learned when I was getting into tea is that this plant is actually an, uh, an evergreen. So being from up here in Canada, um, all our evergreens have needles, you know, spine, pine, spruce, fir, those kind of things. Um, so I was a little bit shocked to learn that this leaf is actually an evergreen leaf. We don't have them like that here. And finally, um, when I talk about tea in this presentation, I'm going to be using the strict definition of tea, which means it is made with this plant, the Camellia sinensis plant. So herbal infusions are awesome, like rooibos, mint, chamomile. I love those as well. But, um, and honestly, I don't mind people call that herbal tea. No big deal, but just for clarity in this presentation, if I talk about tea, I mean with, uh, with this leaf processed in some way. All right, so I promised you guys, maybe slightly threaten you guys with a little history lesson, but um, I promise it's gonna be short. The aim and the purpose of this is just to help it sink in just how ancient of a tradition uh, tea is in China. Even though most Chinese, uh, most Chinese people themselves don't know much about tea in the sense of tasting great tea and how it's processed and all that, but it is woven into their culture. They all drink it, they all know it. And um, so I'm gonna cover just six, six really important personalities just really quickly. Books have been written about and by many of these guys, about all of them. Um, so I can't really do them justice in this presentation, but I just want to highlight their contribution. Um, and the bullets underneath will show you kind of other things that were going on. Um, were going on around their epoch, the time-ish when they were on the planet, when they were around. And um, yeah. So the first guy, let me just uh, move myself out of the way. The first guy is Chanel. Yeah, you guys make sure you can still hear me. Good. I can actually see when you can hear me. So I just kind of totally missed that. So, hey, Simrajit, how you doing? So the first guy here is Chanel. Let me see if my laser pointer is working. Oh, yeah. Give me a little shout out if you can see my laser pointer. So Chanel is literally legendary, right? Um, I'll slide over here. He's literally legendary. So, and by that, I mean, there, there's sort of a legend that surrounds him. He is attributed with the discovery of tea. And there's a bunch of versions of the story. 
we're not even sure if it was one guy. Maybe he's sort of a, a conglomeration of uh, a bunch of people who were prehistoric and helped figure out all kinds of different foods that people could eat without getting poisoned. That's sort of what his claim to fame is. And of course, then he a, a, a drop of water fell off of a tea leaf into his mouth. The tea leaf fell into his mouth. There's a bunch of versions. But this is the guy who is attributed with the discovery of tea. And now it was very different back in the time. You can see 3000 BC, right? Um, Hey, cool. Um, I'm glad you guys like the, uh, the, the quote unquote lecture format. I hope it's still fun, but um, it's just a handy way for me to get some information across. So, but thanks for the feedback. I really appreciate it. So, um, right. And um, Here's a result from search. I, oh, Google heard me. That was pretty funny. So anyway, the, what I wanted to say was back then in that time, 3000 BC, tea was a totally different thing, right? It was used for cooking, it was used for medicine, maybe also drinking, but it's not at all what we think of when we think of tea nowadays. So next up is Lu Yu. Uh, a lot of people who are into tea know Lu Yu, uh, wrote classic of tea, um, uh, Cha Jing. Uh, he, and he really formalized and ceremonialize the process by which tea is prepared. And when I say prepared, it's everything from how to process tea, how to boil the water, how to actually prepare the tea like at the tea table for guests, how to taste the tea, how to use the vessels. Really, really detailed sort of breakdown of exactly how tea, the, the way to enjoy tea. Um, little interesting thing about Lu Yu and the process of making tea, like the actual plucking and making of tea, a while ago we actually worked with a producer who reproduced his process. We had these little tea cakes, a little bigger than the coins I just showed you, maybe, uh, maybe about, uh, about that big. And it was actually processed in the way that Lu Yu recorded. And I know a few of you may have tried those. <laughs> So I see that, um, that somebody commented about the horns. I was going to mention that and then I kind of dropped it. But I'm going to come back just to Shenong for a second because he does have horns and that freaked me out too. So very different than sort of Western culture, right? Horns have this association with evil or, you know, badness. And my immediate impression of him was he looked a little bit nasty and a little bit like ugly. Um, in um, Chinese culture, this is a way that he looks different and important. So yes, he does have horns and that's sort of why. Um, not sure if he's bullheaded, but, um, uh, or maybe that's a different expression, but really good observation. And yeah, he does have horns. Isn't that bad? That's kind of badass, right? All right. So anyway, that was it for Lu Yu. Um, and so we had those tea cakes and uh, those were really interesting. We even in one of our videos, which I think I put the link down below or I will, we actually, um, we actually tried to put some spices and stuff in the in the tea, like kind of how they would have prepared it in Lu Yu's time. And you watch the video to see how that turned out. <laughs> Not delicious. So next up is uh, Song Hui Zong, this guy right here. So Song Hui Zong was an emperor, actually. So up until now, these people were kind of they were what they were, but this guy was uh, historically an emperor also wrote a book called uh, Treatise on Tea, Da Guan Cha Lun, and uh, he helped to make tea even more famous. Okay, tea's already gaining some momentum by this time, and you can see we're jumping ahead in history quite a bit, right? We went from 3000 BC all the way up into the 600s AD. Now we're in sort of the 960 to 1200 AD zone. Um, and how did he help make it famous? Well, simply because he took a strong liking to tea and he was an emperor. So in those times, you know, no Instagram, no uh, celebrities, no Hollywood. So who were, the, who were the people who people look up to to see what's good? It was the emperor, right? About a hundred times what a celebrity endorsement is today. You know, just, just to say that he was the guy. What he liked was important. Um, what's the point of saying that this guy made tea famous? Well, he put a lot of effort into it, but tea is consistently now being heavily woven into Chinese culture. It's impacting everything from the growing of tea to the drinking of tea and how it's enjoyed. All right.
So next up is um, another emperor, uh, Zhu Yuan Zhang. Okay, so I like this guy, okay, because this is an emperor who uh, started out as a peasant, okay, he, and, um, and he started to steer the, the, the uh, tradition away from a now centuries old tradition of tribute cake tea. All right, so the other emperors, you know, were, were getting, would, they would find a tea, they love it, and it would be sent to them and to the, to the palace as cakes. And this guy actually said, uh, in his mind, this was way too decadent, too fancy, and he actually banned it. He banned imperial tribute cake tea. So you might think, well, how can this guy be good for tea? Like, what, what's his contribution if he's going around banning tea? But, um... But actually what happened is this started to open the door to uh, give space for people to do other things with tea. Um, there is all kinds of production, people producing tea, and suddenly they're not sending it here. They've got to find a way to get people to like it. So it opened the door. It opened a door to have people start and look at other ways to make tea and kind of started to move towards the six categories we know today. It didn't just happen overnight, but this guy kind of nudged things in that direction. Now we shoot way forward into sort of modern history up until uh, up into the 1800s, late 1800s with uh, Wu Junon. So this, is, this guy is known as the modern day tea sage. And um, he is a really a hero. Um, you know, obviously quite recent history. So we really um, deeply understand his contribution to tea. And he actually, without him, uh, there may not have, we may not be enjoying Chinese tea today. He helped tea survive through some really, really terrible times, World War I, World War II, Cultural Revolution, etc. All of these major um, world-changing events had a big impact on China as well, obviously, and had a big and mostly negative impact on Chinese tea production. And he helped the um, production methods and the whole culture of Chinese tea stay alive. And last but certainly not least is uh, Mr. Zhang Tianfu, who only recently, a few years ago, passed away. Um, so if you enjoy oolong or black tea, you got to thank Mr. Zhang Tianfu. Okay, he dedicated his life to education, production, and research. Uh, he invented simple machines that producers could either build or easily acquire, cheaply acquire, that allowed them to produce um, oolong tea affordably and with a pretty consistent quality. And he spread modern techniques around all over China. Uh, really, one of the uh, another one of his claims to fame is he spent time in academia, in the academia side of tea and on the farm and really worked hard to bridge the gap to bring the sort of to bring both worlds together and get them working together um, so a very very important figure in uh in the world of tea so you see from these six guys the tea has always had and is still very very important in china but while um it, and for many many uh it's just a beverage to share with friends and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but there is a whole culture of tasting grade tea um, that aspires for the perfect cup where flavor is only one element of the experience. So just a few comments here. I'd heard the first three people, but none of the three modern are familiar. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that, you, uh, that, I'm, that you've learned something new. That's awesome. Yes, so thank you, Jum Tan Fu, Oolong. All right. Ooh, I'm all over the place. All right, so um, let's move on. We're getting into some, so that was your history lesson, guys. You survived, there's not gonna be any exam. Everything is fine. Um, just give you a, a view, and I'm glad I could share with at least some of you some new names in Chinese tea history from ancient to all the way to modern, just really um, sort of touching on it. You could go way deeper than that, but Moving on, we're gonna to touch now on brewing vessels. So, um, first, the first and foremost, we've got the uh, humble uh, tumbler, regular old um, glass tumbler. Uh, it can either be like that with no handle or like the one I have, a little bit more Western style with a handle. 
and uh, timeless and elegant, right? This is, the, and this is, I think maybe surprising for a lot of you, but this is the primary brewing vessel, vessel used in China. Um, people are just gonna grab a tumbler, they're gonna throw some leaf in the cup and put boiling water on it and enjoy their tea. Um, so, and, and, and that's why in most of our how to brew videos, we feature how to brew in a, in a tumbler because it's a really important um, tool for brewing. And also, if you, um, if you like to grab and go with a travel mug or whatever every now and then, this brewing method is really good for, like it's, it can be, you use exactly the same method for your travel mug. If you've got a really giant one, you just scale it up. Um, and yeah, so you toss the leaf in, you put the boiling water, you filter with your teeth. A lot of folks call that grandpa style. I love that term. And um, yeah, it's great. The next two vessels here are are Gong Fu brewing vessels, which literally means Kung Fu, which I think is kind of one of the coolest things about Gong Fu tea, is that it shares something with Kung Fu. Um, and it's, so what does Gong Fu tea mean? Um, uh, Gong Fu simply means mastery. So it's just, and in Gong Fu tea, it's just a way of brewing that uses a much uh, higher leaf to water ratio than Western brewing. Um, the hot water is placed in with the leaves for less time, and then each infusion is tasted separately. And you can check out all kinds of videos on our channel or whenever we do Sunday Tea Book coming up uh, in a couple days, we typically do Gung Fu either in a Gai Wan or a teapot. So that brings us to the Yixing teapot next on the list. Oh, there's my pointer. So um, I actually have, I brought some to show you too. So they can be different shapes. You see these are slightly different shapes. Um, this is, these things are gorgeous. Um, they're tiny compared to Western teapots. That's why I brought one to actually hold for you because from the pitch, from the slide, you can't really get a scale, but, and I brought kind of a middle of the road size one. So we have some that are bigger. We have actually some that are smaller, but you can see this is tiny and super, super cute um, compared to a Western teapot, which can also be cute, but they're just much bigger. Um, yeah, so you wanna be careful with these, not just because they're fragile, but these are super addictive. They're cute. They're, um, it's a super fun way to brew tea. And uh, as far as I know, there's no support group for once, once you're hooked. So if you guys hear about a support group for yeasting clay teapot addiction, I'm, I, need the, I need the contact info because Jen has a serious, serious problem with yeasting teapot addiction. So let me know in the, in the chat, please. So, um, and then, uh, finally, on the slide, we've got the, uh, the Gai Wan. I brought one, but it's basically just like a little teacup. Uh, it's about the same size as a Western teacup, but with a lid instead of a handle. And, um, and this is mostly used for Gong Fu brewing, but also used for uh, drinking, which we have in uh, one of our videos, How to Drink from a Gai Wan, which is that was totally a shock to me when I, uh, I arrive at... Um, at um, Mr. Su's house, who makes Bitan Piao Su, and um, Su Gong Cha, he makes Su Gong Cha, same tea, different um, ones, his is named after him, and he started, and all I had was a guy one, I had to drink from it. Anyway, check the video. I'll go way over time if I tell every, every single story I have. Mm. All right, and not shown, but I brought one to show you, is also the ever-important teacup. So this tasting cup um, allows you to enjoy, so you might ask, why are they so small, right? I get that a lot, especially with, for people that are new to tea. Why is the teacup so darn small? And it allows you to enjoy piping hot tea um, and close to room temperature tea in a reasonable amount of time, right? In this big mug, my tea it takes a while to cool. Once it's cool, it's cool, and it'll be a while before I can warm it up. But in this little guy, I can have piping hot tea. I can feel by the cup, oh, that tea is really hot. I'm not gonna sip it yet. Maybe I'll smell it. And then I can aerate the hot tea into my mouth. I can taste it hot and taste it at room temperature, which you'd be surprised. There is a, and sometimes quite remarkable, uh, tasting profile difference as the tea starts to cool. So, um, and it also facilitates tasting each infusion from the Gai Wan or the teapot separately. So that is a quick look at brewing ves vessels. So now let's dive into the tea itself. 
All right. So you've probably all heard of black tea and maybe most of you have heard of green tea and maybe oolong tea, but what is it that makes one tea category different from another? It is the process, in fact, not the color, not anything else. That means the way by which we take a raw leaf, pluck it, and turn it into a finished, uh, finished tea, a finished product to go into your, your yixing teapot, your gaiwan, your cup, whatever. So process defines tea category. And why is that important? Because process is also the main contributor, probably more than 80% of what you're tasting when you taste a tea comes from the process. Do terroir and cultivar matter? Of course they matter. Where the tea is grown and what specific type of plant it is, is definitely going to impact the flavor as well. But a good goal for an, aspire, for an aspiring taster is to be able to taste the tea and taste the category. Um, most of what you're tasting is the process. Okay, so let me get out of the way so you can see this whole thing. So this is a pretty scary chart um, and uh, pretty scary. Hopefully, maybe it's scary if you're new and maybe if you're really familiar with tea, it's not uh, it's not all that scary. My goal is for those of you who are like, holy cow, this is really complicated. I want to kind of simplify it for you and make it less scary. And for those of you that are super comfortable for it, with it, I'd like to make it more scary for you. You'll see why. <laughs> all right. That might be weird, right? But, but before I do, I do that, let's just get some terminology straight. So we, we, know what, we know what we're talking about. Laser pointer on. All right. So down along the bottom here, the first word I want to kind of make sure that we clarify is the word um, is the word oxidation and fermentation. They're sometimes used interchangeably with tea, and I will not be using these words interchangeably because it can be quite confusing once you get into all the different tea types. So oxidation we've got down here along the bottom, um, sort of from least over on the um, uh, left to most on the right, and um, so oxidation, so what is oxidation, right? So I love to use the banana or the apple, the fruit metaphor or the fruit um, analogy maybe. So when a banana is, is left out uh, or an apple is cut and left out, right? It will turn brown in the air after a few minutes and certainly after longer. This is the process of oxidation. I think the actual name for it is enzymatic browning. Oxidation will work fine for our purposes. And uh, fermentation, on the other hand, is not shown in the chart, right? We don't see it anywhere on the whole chart, but it's hiding right here. It's hiding in the dark tea piled uh, step. And what it is, is it's, the tea is, is piled, um, and that's when fermentation occurs. It's similar, it's actually similar to composting, which maybe sounds a little gross, but it's actually very technical. And it has to be uh, it has to be done very precisely, or the batch of tea is ruined. And when it's done right, it tastes delicious. Fermentation is what gives my shupuar tonight its uh, unique you know, its unique flavor. Okay, so that gets oxidation and fermentation out of the way. And um, is there a place to get this chart? I think it's on our website somewhere. Um, I would check there and I'll try and find it and put a link in the description below. Cindy asked if there's a place to get, to get the uh, chart. So, um, and certainly it's appeared in uh, some of our videos, I think. So, um, right. So that's oxidation fermentation. So now I'm going to ask you guys a question. Okay. Fingers crossed that we, uh, that we get some answers here. So, Okay, just blurt out whatever comes to your mind. Oxidation, fermentation, green tea, oolong tea, but why do we process tea? What is the point of processing tea? What are we trying to do when we process tea? All right, I don't know how long the lag will be, but I'm going to give you guys a second. So why do we process tea? All right. Okay. So I don't know if it's lag or just crickets, but <laughs> the point is the point of uh, processing tea is basically to remove water from the leaf. So basically all we're trying to do, you know, you might say, oh, it's to preserve it. It's to make it taste better. It's definitely 
going to make it taste better. But the main thing is, is to make it is to preserve it by removing water. So if that's all we're doing is removing water, there's, these are all basically, all of these different steps, all they are is removing water. So why don't they just all say drying? Right? And the thing is, each of these steps is actually represents a different way to remove water and a fundamentally and fundamentally is, has a different result. Um, in fact, for those of you who are pretty comfortable with this chart, and that's where I kind of wanted to bring back a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of the sort of um, amazing part of this chart, is this chart is really a huge oversimplification of each of the processes. As you guys know, there's tons of different green teas and they don't necessarily do these steps in this order, right? They each individual tea has its own process, yellow teas, oolong teas, really complicated, tons of steps there. They each have their own process. So actually this is just a real simple way to kind of wrap our heads around what are the main differences between the different tea categories, the different tea processes. And as I dive into each one of them, that's what I'm going to be highlighting, sort of the key step in each of these processes that makes the, is sort of the most responsible for bringing the, that tea types flavor. All right. I'm back. So green tea, we'll start with green tea. We'll just work our way across. So for how many of you guys, is, is anybody out there, is green tea your favorite tea? Just uh, normally I would ask you to raise your hand, but just shoot out a little, you know, me or a thumbs up or whatever in the comment. I like green tea plenty, but I, I honestly can't say it's one of my go-to teas. I really like it in the, obviously in the spring when I'm really sick of winter. Um, okay, so great tea, right? This is a fresh, light, energizing, super delicious tea. Um, uh, with a few basic steps shown here, right? Where's my, with just these few basic steps. Um, but I, but as I mentioned, right, each green tea actually has its own type of steps that it does. And the one, the most important thing to know about green tea is the, the step that, uh, that really brings that fresh invigorating flavor is the kill green step. Brandon, green tea is your fave. Thank you, buddy. That's awesome. So, um, yes, so, uh, so the kill green is the step. So let's take a quick look at the uh, kill green step. Um, this is a clip from one of our YouTube videos. So, um, <laughs> so make, I'll just do a quick, yeah, so this is a clip from a YouTube video that I want to show you that kind of highlights the kill green. And um, here it is.现在是第三道工序哈第一道工序采摘第二道工序是应该是摊青这道工序就是杀青底下是烧炭的吗还是比较传统的这个做法是以烧炭的来我们把镜头再转到这边过来看一下看这个就是后面的这个用的这个炭
And um, I don't want to leave you guys thinking though that this is sort of the normal or a, a green tea needs to be hand kill green in order for it to be good. Um, there are some great, obviously some really great green teas that are handmade, but there are plenty of really, really good uh, machine-made green teas too. Um, otherwise, none of us would be able to afford green tea. So these handmade teas are really expensive. And if you find yourself uh, purchasing a high-end handmade green tea for a super bargain basement price, you should be pretty skeptical. What we, what we always say is just buy the tea based on the flavor and its value and forget about any sort of fancy marketing around, around that kind of jazz. So just a few more takeaways around green tea here as I refill. Um, so locations it comes from, as the most common tea in uh, China, it literally comes from all over China. Just about every tea growing region has their, um, has a local green tea. Um, a few famous ones would be uh, Lomjin, uh, which is shown up here. Um, uh, Lomjin, uh, Huangsha Maofang, down in the middle here. Um, and we just talked about these two actually on last episode of, a couple episodes ago of Sunday Tea Book. Um, Guju Zisun is another very famous one and Anji Bai Cha. And uh, those are both coming up. We're in the green tea part of Sunday Tea Book. So be sure to check that out too. The naming of green tea primarily is by uh, the region that it's from. And in terms of health benefits and risks, we're not really like big into sort of the um, sort of the trendy health health marketing stuff vis-a-vis -vis tea. Um, it can be high in antioxidants. It's true, um, but for green tea and its particular health benefits, I will also warn you that uh, although it's high in anti antioxidants, if you go crazy drinking tons and tons of it, it can be pretty hard on the tummy. Um, so you kind of want to make sure you balance balance things out. I'm going to mention a couple notes about uh, transparency too. Um, and just because the Angie by Cha reminds me of that. Back in 2014, when we were uh, buying spring tea, uh, Angie by Cha market was on fire. It was super, super expensive to get a kind of okay Angie by Cha. But um, so we bought a Chengxing by Cha, which is a neighboring mountain. Uh, the tea process ends up that the tea looks pretty much identical. Um, and my point here is that we see teas like Chengxing by Cha all the time being sold as under their more famous counterpart names, uh, similar with Lomjin. You'll see that this year we actually have a Mingxian, not Lomjin. And that's kind of a similar story. The producer of that tea is from Guizhou. Um, so he was previously selling, selling his Lomjin to, um, uh, he was previously selling his Lomjin to producers in Hangzhou so that it could be sold as Lomjin. So if you're sourcing teas and you're getting them from the right region, it even doesn't guarantee that you're getting them from that region. But this, this guy decided, you know what, my tea is pretty decent. I'm just going to go out there. It's got a great chestnut aroma, thick taste, and he makes a really great Lomjin style tea. And he decided just to be more transparent and to just, um, and, and we pick that up and we sell it as not Lomjin kind of to be fully full disclosure and if you check the notes we, we mentioned that it's from uh, Guizhou. And the great thing about working with Jen and her mom is that they have the ability to look at the leaf and of course taste the tea and they know if it's the real deal uh, regardless of what they've been told by the producers. So transparency is a huge thing for us. Our whole mission is to bring you authentic tasting grade Chinese tea and that doesn't mean it has to be expensive. Uh, as in the case of the Not Lom Jin and many others. But we're always going to be straight with you about where the tea comes from. And we want to make sure its tasting profile is on point. So any of our teas, you can sip them and take them as an educational experience. So let me just check the questions here. Simmerjeet says, how long do green teas keep? That's a great question. Um, we typically say um, store them in a cool location, maybe in your fridge, depending how much you have, and should last you for a couple years. A good green tea should last, you know, you want to drink them up. 
Don't, it's not like an oolong or a black tea where there's no hurry at all. You can store those. A good oolong, you can age it. A good, obviously, puar. So drink them up in a couple of years. Great questions. Thanks, Simmerjeet. Hmm. Yeah, and Cindy mentioned that she had seen that video. So that's a clip from another one of our YouTube videos. But yeah, after the kill green, the leaves are actually pretty floppy. Um, so as you kind of saw in, later in that video there. All right, so on to white tea. So for how many of you folks, uh, how many, I think most of you have probably heard of white tea. I know most of you out there in the crowd are into tea. And um, for me, this is getting up there. I got to say that I'm coming around to white tea being one of my favorite teas. So let me know if it's, if it's your favorite tea in the comments there. And um, so look at this process though, right? Withering and drying. This is the simplest process. Don't take that the wrong way, right? That doesn't mean that white tea is easy to make at all. Um, but as far as the process goes, the tea is plucked, withered, and dried. So the most important step that brings the uh, flavor in this is the drying process. All right, there is basically two ways this is done. It can have a light roast, which is sometimes called oven dried, but don't think the oven is like the temperature where you'd roast a chicken or something. It's just a light, gentle heat. And the other method is sun drying. Um, the main difference is, is the way the aroma is going to present. An oven roasted tea is going to have plenty of floaty aroma and fragrance, and it'll be pretty easy to pick up. Um, whereas the sun dried is going to be more reserved in terms of aroma, but it's going to have a really rich mouthfeel. In general, sun dried are considered the better teas. Ah, diversified. White tea is one of your faves too. Awesome. And Simmerji likes it in the summertime. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Cindy, I'm, I'm really anxious to hit your favorite tea type. I think we're going to hit it soon. All right, so here's some pictures from uh, Fuding in Taimushan. Um, so whenever you see a red Chinese, red, red, uh, red Chinese characters carved into a rock, have a good look around because there's probably a famous tea plant somewhere. Um, here we see the uh, mother plant of, uh, in this shot here, you see the mother tree of white tea. The next picture um, gives you an idea of the leaf size, the size of the bud, you can see right here, and the leaf. So you see this, this cultivar, the white tea's made, that has pretty big leaves. And, um, and last but not, and here's some tea just uh, in its drying phase, um, in the drying phase. And last but not least is uh, lovely shatai. Um, this is the monk who, along with her protege, Shifu, makes, uh, makes most of our white tea. Uh, she's super interesting, and I actually got a chance to meet her back in 2019 during our tea trip. Uh, nobody knows her actual name. Shatai is actually her title. Um, she's a monk as well as Shifu, and um, that's just what she goes by. And during harvest time, those two, they, um, they get all the villagers to help them out with the, uh, with the harvest, with the plucking and whatnot but they are responsible for most of our white tea. Delightful. Definitely recommend a visit to Taimushan if you ever get a chance. All right, so in terms of locations where white tea is made, Fuding is the original place where it comes from, but you can find white teas made in a variety of other places. Uh, remember, uh, white tea has nothing to do with the color, okay, of the leaf or the liquor, which is, tends to be fairly clear. It is the process. I say this because um, some people assume or are led to believe that it's called white tea because of the, uh, because sometimes it appears white, especially Bai Hao Yin Zhen. Um, but um, Bai Hao Yin Zhen actually shouldn't be so white. It should be covered in fuzz but the bud should actually have quite a decent greenish hue and you want to watch out brown or black tips on those buds are not desired. And um, in terms of the famous ones, I would have to say Bai Hao Yin Zhen is the most famous. Bai Mu Dan is, um, I would say, somewhat well known. But in the end, there's only three types of white tea. Bai Hao Yin Zhen, Bai Mu Dan, and Shou Mei. Um, bai, and these are actually a way to describe to describe the uh, 
the contents of the tea, the plucking standard of the tea. Bai Hao Yin Zhen, shown up here, is entirely made from buds. Bai Mu Dan is uh, one bud and one or two leaves. And Shou Mei is not shown, is entirely leaf. Um, the tea names loosely, loosely, very loosely imply the grade. So Bai Hao Yin Zhen is kind of at the top of that spectrum with Shou Mei at the bottom. But there is a ton of overlap, okay? Um, a super top grade Shomei or a top grade Bai Mudan is definitely going to have a better, uh, is going to be a better, um, a be is going to be better than a, a mediocre or a poorly made Bai Hao Gen. White tea is a great tea for aging as well. Um, it will gradually darken and turn brown and, and, uh, and the flavor will go from that sort of, uh, uh, crisp floral by Mudan tends to have a bit bit of an element of a, a fruitiness uh, it'll go from that to more of a datey uh, like a dried date sometimes a little bit earthy a richer soothing feel when they age the Chinese actually have a saying uh, first year tea third year medicine seventh year treasure and as for health benefits this tea is really good. Um, we kind of look at these from a, more of a traditional Chinese medicine perspective. So it's not like all teas are good for, uh, you know, antioxidants and cancer. Then that's the end of the story. No, it's more particular, and the, um, how good they are is not, you know, miraculous or anything. Um, this tea is really good for um, soothing upper respiratory discomfort. Um, if I'm at a tea festival and talking a lot with people all day long, I'll very likely have a white tea going on the side just to keep me kind of lubricated and keep my voice in good shape. So, and also be aware that white tea, like all other teas, has caffeine, okay? There was a myth around for a little while that white tea had zero caffeine. Um, that is definitely not true. It's 100% wrong. Um, check out that process. All we do is pluck, uh, wither, and dry. Where did the caffeine go? No, it's all in there. Um, let's see. White tea is a fave of mine. Yeah, I enjoy Bai Hao Yin Zhen mostly in the summers. Mm. Yeah, I kind of like Bai Hao Yin Zhen year round. Um, and Cindy says, where does Ya Bao fit in? It depends. I don't know off the top of my head, Cindy. It really depends on the plucking standard. So you can actually, if you have that tea, you can brew it, uh, dig around in your gaiwan, pull out a couple samples and see what you see. If you don't see buds, show me. If you see buds and leaf, it's a Bai Mudan. And if you see only buds, it's a Bai Hao Yin Zhen style tea. If it's a white tea. I've never heard of Ya Bao. And my, uh, my boss ain't here to straighten me out. All right, yellow tea. So what is this odd devil? You guys, uh, again, the guys who are here with me, you guys have probably all heard of yellow tea, but for many people, this is a really uh, strange tea category. They've never heard of yellow tea. Um, for me, this is, the high-end yellow teas are up there among my favorites. If it's one of your favorites, let me know. I would be a little bit surprised because again, it's just a really rare tea and it's lesser known. The reason for that is, um, and in fact, it's, we actually didn't start have, we didn't have yellow teas in the early days of Gen Tea. Uh, we couldn't find, we actually couldn't find anyone who was making an authentic yellow tea. Um, the key step, uh, the key step here, we have now found them and we've got a couple. The key step, of course, doesn't tell you much, but it's this here yellowing step. All right. So what this is, is it's just a slight oxidation. You'll notice that the other steps, airing, kill green, shaping, and drying, are very similar to green tea. There's just this yellowing step inserted in here. And that is precisely the reason that it's rare, because we're introducing a little bit of oxidation. And the way they do this is, um, is they just introduce a little bit of heat and a little bit of moisture for precisely the right amount of time. Now you can kind of, without too much imagination, you can figure out why this is rarer. It's because, uh, imagine you're bringing in your harvest, you're making tea, and you can make a green tea, um, right? Which is the most popular tea in China. Or you can make a yellow tea, which is less popular, even in China. It's going to take longer because you've got an extra step. 
It may even mean you have to wake up several times in the middle of the night to check on it. And if you mess up the step, you've ruined the batch of tea. All right, that is why yellow tea, authentic yellow tea is so rare. It's a real labor of love. So, um, that's awesome. So yellow tea comes from a few regions. The locations it's from is, um, we currently have a couple, Huang Da Cha, and, which is from Anhui, and a Da Ye Qing, which is from Guangdong. Um, some of the famous yellow teas are Hoshan Huang Ya, Junxian, Junxian Yin Zhen, and, um, which is actually shown down here in the bottom of the picture. And this one's actually famous for its dancing needles. So this is just a still, right? But when you're brewing this, the needles will kind of um, uh, sink down and float up and down and do a little dance. And it's actually very mesmerizing and beautiful. Uh, if you ever get a chance to try that tea, um, definitely try it. And um, like green tea, yellow tea is named for the region it comes from. So with maybe a little bit of extra information, like whether it contains uh, whether it's made from buds or contains buds. Okay, so the, here's one that I've been waiting for. Um, how many of you uh, it, have oolong, consider oolong your favorite tea? I'm kind of uh, waiting to see if uh, Cindy answers. I think this might be the one, not sure. Uh, I, I raise my hand on this one. Um, I'm not supposed to have favorites, but this is an awesome tea category. And one of the reasons it is so awesome is, um, is because of the oxidation spectrum that it covers. From um, We looked, if you remember back to that chart, we had from not oxidized on the green tea side to fully oxidized on the black tea slash dark tea side. And this category sits right in the middle. So as a partially oxidized tea, that means that we have a huge spectrum that we can cover from just you know teasing the oxidation to getting in pretty heavy into the oxidation. And consequently, that means we get uh, a, an amazing range of flavor spectrum from this tea. All right. Um, oh, wow, lots of people here. So diversified, it's one of her faves. Oh, Cindy has tried yellow tea a couple of times. Have, have, have you have the yellow tea that's being produced? In? No, I haven't tried the uh, the Mississippi one, Cindy. I didn't notice it. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Simmerji really likes oolongs. Um, Dee's Versified loves uh, a Dom Ding, I guess. Ding Dong, Dong Dong. I've seen a t-shirt, an awesome t-shirt called uh, Dom Ding, The Witch is Dead. Um, I think um, one of my friends has that. It made me laugh so hard. Pretty high on Brandon's list, and uh, ding, yes. Awesome, so um, so the key step in this process though, I didn't really um, point it out, it's the, uh, let me go back, it's the shaking right here. Oh, let me get my laser, right there. And so we're, I'm actually gonna show you a real buff dude here. So the shaking process, this is the delicate process of agitating and slightly bruising the leaf to encourage oxidation. Okay, it, it's, it, it's, this is so tricky. So let's go back to the banana. If you remember, I was talking about the banana a while ago. Um, it'll turn brown if you leave it out. Well, imagine you bounce the banana up and down for a little while, pretty carefully, so you don't totally trash it. And uh, to, that would make it turn brown faster, right? So that's exactly what, what this guy is doing. He's bouncing the tea leaves up and down. And I say it really cute like that, but he's actually turning them all over. It's actually a rotating motion, and he can actually turn them all over each time. Each time he rotates them to make sure that they're actually bruising evenly. Um, it's it's actually unbelievable. So first, that thing is big, as you can see. This guy is not a small dude. Second, it's heavy. So um, this guy is uh, totally amazing. So the picture below here, I'll just slide out of the way. Shows uh, Jian uh, shows. Whoops, Daisy. Sorry about that, guys. Shows Jian Li and Jen with uh, Mr. Jiang Tianfu. And um, in the middle, I mentioned before, right? If you love black tea or oolong tea, this is the guy to thank. 
Um, he literally dedicated his whole life to making black tea and oolong tea better, working in the academic environment, also on farms with producers. Um, I talked about him in the history section, but it, it's impossible to overstate how awesome he was for tea. Um, so cheers to Mr. Zheng Tianfu. So the rest of the pictures show the other steps in the process. Up here in the center, we have just after the kill green, then the tea heads into the rolling machine here. And then the pictures below show uh, the rolled tea being mixed. So they have to uh, pull it out of that, out of this sort of bag that it's in and kind of rotate it up so it gets uh, evenly rolled. If you've noticed, oolong teas tend to be a little bit or possibly sometimes a lot more expensive than their counterparts, uh, then you can attribute it to this, uh, the, the length of the process and the number of skillful steps that are involved. Okay, more steps means more time, tons of ma machines are used, there's n absolutely no shame in it. Again, uh, we see a guy hand shaking a tea here, this is going to be a super expensive tea. Okay, um, most oolongs, the vast, vast majority of oolongs are uh, machine made and thank heavens for that or again, we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to enjoy them uh, as much as, as frequently as we do. Okay. So um, again, there's no, no reason to um, hate machine made tea. It's really about how well it's made and, and all of those machines are being monitored by skill. Well, when the tea is well made, it's a skill for producer who knows when to put it in the machine, when to take it out, how to keep, make sure that it's evenly rolled, how to, it's, it's, it's a game of timing. Yeah, it was very cool to uh, meet him for them. Very, uh, very humbling. All right, so um, here we see pictured a few of the uh, formats, the forms that Oolong can take. Um, so head on over to our website. You can check out, uh, we have a very a, a big Oolong section, so you can see all kinds of different uh, Oolongs there as well. Um, but you can see that it has a lot more, a lot of different forms, right? You've got rolled, like this uh, bald take one yin here in the upper left. We've got a uh, straight leaf, like this guy here. Uh, we've got a pressed cake of Jungping Shui Xian, so that's about a one and a half inch or maybe two, two centimeter, two or three centimeter square little, uh, little cake of tea. And oolongs are primarily made in the southeast of China, down in the belly, Fujian, Guangdong, and obviously Taiwan. Um, and lots of famous oolongs, but the really, really well known ones are Tai Guan Yin, Da Hong Pao, Bao Zhong, and Dong Ding. Uh, but the list goes on. It's a pretty deep uh, tea category. Unlike green and yellow teas, oolong teas are typically named for their cultivar um, rather than where they're from. Taeguan Yin cultivar, Shui Xian cultivar, Bayad Silan. Those are specific types of the Camellia sinensis plant. Mm. Yeah, and I see a little uh, in the chat there, Diversified was wondering why Oriental Beauty is expensive. And that's right, the bug bitten does in indeed lower the yield. All right, moving along, black tea. So, um, this is another sort of big daddy of tea consumption. It's way, right up there with green tea, um, uh, with tea, tea consumption globally and tea production in China. Um, this would be the export tea, although that is slow, kind of changing, not, it's kind of green tea stays in China and black tea goes away. So I'm gonna assume that everybody here has heard of black tea. This is sort of the, uh, this is sort of the one that is really what we, what I grew up with anyway, and what a lot of us kind of grew up with, you know, having tea with your grandma or whatever, uh, back in the day. So, um, yeah, in fact, I just, before I got into tea, when I said tea, this is what I meant. Um, but this tea category, because of, for the same reasons I just kind of mentioned, it kind of gets, uh, kind of gets a bad name. Uh, I guess because of Tetley's, Red Rose, Lipton, and the other mass tea marketers 
It's become kind of a poor cousin in the uh, tasting grade tea world. And honestly, it's really not fair. And I think Simmerjeet will definitely agree with me there. So the main step here is the, uh, oops, is the rolling step. Is the rolling step. And um, that's the step where we crush the leaf. So we literally um, roll the leaf around so that it gets crushed and the juices are released so they can fully oxidize. Um, so, and what do we mean by fully oxidize? It's back to the banana, right? So it's actually not fully, fully. If we let the tea fully oxidize, we would just have, uh, like if we let the banana fully oxidize, we just have a puddle of like banana goo. It would be gross. Um, and it's similar with tea. Fully oxidized just means it gets to the state where we don't want it to go any further. It's, it's not going to be any good at all. So, um, and that's where the skill enters big time. It's just like I say it just like that, but how do you know when it's time, it's done? How do you know if you don't stop too early? And it's an oolong, right? It's skill. It's amazing skill and all the senses are involved. Yeah, black tea is a favorite of Brandon's. And that's Simmerji's favorite, I thought so. Uh, Post-traumatic tea bag disorder. Cindy suffers from PTTD. So I'm just learning to appreciate some of the black teas that don't have that. That's an awesome, awesome little, uh, little, yes, post that. So I think I'm going to use that if you don't mind, Cindy, in the future to explain the whole black tea stigma. PTTD. That is rich. I love that. One cup of your expertly made ginger may or yin home number nine and everyone would be smitten. Mm, great one. Yeah, thanks, Simmerjeet, for that. Also, the, uh, um, oh, I want to ch just chit chat with you guys, but also the Lapsung. We meet so many people who, uh, I think I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold that thought, but yes. All right, so the main step is the, uh, right, we crush it, but oxidize. Okay. I was finished. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So the picture in the bottom center here shows uh, Jen working with Mr. Young, who's actually our Te Guan Yin producer, but he makes a killer black tea, Guan Yin Hom, um, made from Te Guan Yin cultivar. So she's doing the rolling step by hand here again as sort of an exercise. And she had a certain amount of tea. It was too much to kind of work with. So she broke it into three mini piles so she could roll them individually. But the problem was um, when she would roll one of her small piles, the other piles were oxidizing. So when she finished, the leaves weren't evenly oxidized and it did affect the flavor of that mini little batch that she made. So again, this illustrates sort of how delicate and technical this process is. Um, and, it's, and it's rarely, rarely, if not never done by hand. Um, but even when it's done by machine, the, produce, the producer has to have the timing really careful and make sure that they're rolled and rotated and they're even. Uh, the, the timing involved is just incredible. Here on the left and the right, we have examples of good quality black teas. Notice that the leaf is whole, even though it has undergone the fa this fairly brutal rolling process. It's not like crushed hair curl, PTTD, post-traumatic tea bag, like that we've seen from tea bags or mass-produced teas. And the building on top is, a, is the home of Lapsam Suchom, the original black tea smoked over pine. Uh, the building is really old and it is literally like, look, you see how dark black it is? It's liter that's literally from the smoking, the, the tea smoking that has gone on for centuries. So, and I was getting into this, I was trying to jump the gun, but again, this is a tea that has a lot of sort of stigma, a little bit of a bad reputation, maybe a lot. A lot of people, um, they don't, a lot of low-end Lapsangs, they have that real blast of almost artificial smokiness, but a good Lapsang should have smokiness that complements the sweetness of the tea. And I was going to say when Simmerjeet was talking about the Jinjin Mei or the Ying Home number nine, um, a lot of people, if we're brewing Lapsang at a tea festival or whatever, and we ask them if they want to try it, they recognize the name and they're like, oh, I don't like Lapsang Suchom. And then we kind of try to entice them to try it because, and in many cases, it's changed their mind. They're like, this is Lapsang? It's still smoky, but it's not a punch in the face, right? It's really balanced. It's really, really expertly made. In fact, the producer of our Lapsam Suchom, his is the 
inventor of Jinjin Mei, the Jinjin Mei that Simranjit was talking about, was commenting about, and his family are the, his ancestors are the ones who invented black tea, la, aka Lapsam Suchom. And yes, Cindy, try some Ying Hong number nine. It's really, really delicious. Mm. All right. So black tea, like green tea, is another massively popular tea category. Um, just about every uh, every region has their version, their own version of black tea. I've mentioned Lapsam Suchon, but some other famous ones include Kimin uh, and Jinjin Mei, which Simmerjeet mentioned, Dian Hom uh, from Yunnan. So, right, a little story about... I are, so black tea is traditionally... And it's traditionally named by location, similar to green tea, right? So Tsimin or Kimin, Dian Hom, which is Dian from Yunnan. And speaking of names, you may have noticed that we always use the uh, we always use the uh, Chinese name for the tea. In general, the Pinyin, but in the case of Lapsam Suchom, that's not true because it's so popular. But we always use the Chinese names for the teas, and the reason for that is not just to make it really hard for you guys to pronounce, but also, as I've been explaining, the, the tea names actually mean something about the tea, where it's from or what cultivar it is. And we really feel that if we translate it, it's gonna lose, it's, it's gonna lose that information. So um, we, cho we choose to stick with the harder to pronounce and have the accurate information rather than have um, an interesting cute name. Not that there's anything wrong with cute names. Michelle Sheshtak just tried Lapsang for the first time. Delicious. Thanks. I'm glad you liked it. Really glad you liked it. All right. So on to dark tea. So we're all the way now. We've started at the, uh, at the least oxidized with green tea. And now we've made our way all the way over to the other end to the, the fully oxidized black tea and now dark tea. So has everybody tried dark tea here? Let me know if you... Uh, Pretty tea lover crowd here. So let me know if you have never tried dark tea. Or if you have, let me know what you've tried. And if it's your favorite. So you may know this as post-fermented tea. Uh, and um, yeah, I have a couple favorites, obviously. Shupuar in this category. So the main step in this one, as I kind of alluded to in the initial process uh, talk, is piling. Um, so this is effectively a super technical type of composting that gives this tea its very unique flavor profile. Um, in the case of Shupuar, think leather, wet wood, moss, mushroom. But in the, in, the, in the entire family of dark teas, some of them have a pretty short piling process. So they're gonna be more in the um, hay, mushroom, a bit more like more refreshing, sometimes watermelon rind. So I really encourage people, if you haven't tried dark tea, this is a category you can really dive into. Of course, Puar has earned some fame recently. It's pretty popular, but uh, there's tons of other great dark teas out there. Tianliang Cha, Tianjian, Liu Bao Cha. I really encourage you to uh, explore this category. It's a really fun one. And yeah, and Simmerji likes Shen Puar. That's another great type of tea. So just want to make sure I didn't miss any um, comments. Yeah, so Cindy appreciates using the real name. It's so confusing when tea sellers make up cute names. You don't know what it really is. Right, right. That's sort of exactly our point. Awesome. So here are some pictures from our tea trip in uh, 2016. So these show some Puar Gardens. Um, hmm. Yeah, and if you've checked out our vlog, we have some even more recent trips to Puar Gardens uh, there. That's kind of why I included the 2016 pictures here. They're not as easy to find on our YouTube channel. So if you look closely, actually, this is pretty cool. I'm going to move so to give you guys the best chance to see. But if you look closely, right, there's actually a dude up in this tree. There's a guy plucking tea in that tree. So why that's interesting is unlike most other cultivars, uh, these, this cultivar grows into pretty big full trees. Um, so, so the, 
The piling process is what gives dark tea its unique flavor, but the other thing for Pu'ar is, the, uh, is these trees. Um, Pu'ar trees, uh, it, the tree brings something really unique to the flavor of Pu'ar. In the upper right here, you can see this is a, this is a very ancient tree. It's actually got this little fence around it to kind of protect it um, because it's so old, it's become quite a tourist attraction. Um, old trees in the, in the Pu'ar domain, again, are real treasures. Uh, they make, uh, and they make very like exquisite tea. Um, and in the picture shown below here, we have some raw materials, so sort of freshly plucked leaves. We just did a video recently uh, tasting our Yiwu Gushu Shem Pu'ar, and the Gushu in that tea name stands for ancient tree. And um, when you taste that, when you sort of get used to tasting the tea from an ancient tree, you cannot, uh, you cannot fake the age. Uh, all kinds of things about the other flavors can be kind of mimicked, but the age is something that cannot be faked. Shempuar. Oh, Cindy says she loves our Fujuan. I'm drinking Shupuar at the moment in solidarity. Mm. Nice. Thanks, Cindy. And Shempuars are hit or miss for you. I love some and found some undrinkable. Yeah, that is sort of uh, very possible with Shempuar. All right. So dark teas tend to be from uh, southwest of China. So Yunnan, Sichuan, Hunan. And some of the famous ones are, as we mentioned, Pu'ar, but Liu Bao Cha and Fujuan, which we've, they've all been mentioned already. Awesome. Fujuan teas uh, are really interesting. They have this, this cool, so here's a Fujuan over here. And they have a unique characteristic um, called Jinhua or golden flower. And the scientific name is Eurotium cristatum. I hope I pronounced that right. So you can see in the picture, um, you can kind of see there's a little yellow fleck in this tea, that little sort of golden or yellow fleck. This is actually a fungus and it's been extensively studied in China and uh, Japan. And it's known to be, uh, it's known to have some really great health benefits. Um, but, but watch out, that being said, you still wanna watch out for moldy tea. This Jinhua is never gonna grow on the surface of the brick. So don't be fooled into buying a spoiled tea with white mold on it. This stuff only, you have to break the brick to see it. Dark teas are named for their location primarily, but there's some variance as with pretty much all of the teas. And I have to be careful here because we use these terms, but um, you gotta watch out for fancy marketing terms like old tree or ancient tree, gushu or lao shu. Uh, we use these terms in our teas and the rule of, uh, we use these terms, these terms in our teas, but again, we make sure that we bring you the authentic real deal. Uh, we use old for the not so old trees, sort of less than a hundred years and ancient for things that are in this sort of hundred and up year range. Um, that's a sort of a loose line, but that's about where we draw it. A lot of these terms are just used to inflate the price. So if you see a tea from 200 year old trees for $10 for a hundred grams, it's definitely not. Um, as always though, if, it's a, if it tastes fine and you like it, let the value be your guide. Just ignore the, uh, the marketing hoopla. Hey, Suana. Yeah, doing great. Thanks for joining. Cindy had a cool experience with Leo Bao tea. I told someone that drinking one made me feel like I was with my dad, gone 20 years in his cranberry warehouse. Yeah, so that's one of the most beautiful things about tea is it does have that ability to really evoke memories. Um, those kind of tasting notes, you know, those memory-based ones that maybe aren't, they're, they're not maybe tasting notes or maybe that's not the right word for them, but they're not things you need to or have to share with other people, but thank you for sharing that with us. That's what tea's all about, really. And I think that's one of the health benefits of tea, too. Um, Simmerji, yes, let's way, way be enjoyable to make gung fu style tea with friends. Mm. Cindy, three days later, my niece told me that drinking tea made her feel like she was with grandpa in the warehouse. Whoa, so you guys had a similar experience. And you didn't tell her, she just had that same, probably something, maybe something about the aroma 
took you back to that space. Like smell is such a visceral sense and so tied to our emotions. That's a really beautiful story, Cindy. Thanks. All right. So, wow, that is really gorgeous. Thank you so much. So back to tea and tasting is um, in making a tea, this, the producer is striving for the perfect sip. At least the good ones are. And as you become more interested in learning and tasting about tea on an appraisal level, one of the elements that becomes important is separating tea that you like personally from tea that is good or maybe bad. And it goes both ways, right? There's teas that you're really fond of, but they maybe aren't that well made. And teas that you really love. No, I just said that. And teas that are really made perfectly, but you just, they're not really your jam. You don't really like those. For me, that's like Fen Huang Dan Song. I've, I've had some Although I do love the really good ones, um, but I'm just a little bit off of the perfect Fen Huang Den song, and I'm like, I have to really put on my little anal my analytical hat, right? So, um, so for example, we had a black tea from Yunnan, um, just a sample that was sent to us from somebody, and um, it was technically like as a black tea, technically based on the tasting notes, it was terrible. It was a total failure or at least a pretty hard fail. Um, it had a really strong bite, um, characteristics of Shem Puar, um, which is from the same region. I absolutely loved it. I drank the whole cake in like record time, right? I just had it every morning, sometimes at, at lunch as well, just blasted through that cake. But as a black tea, the oxidation step was, uh, was a, just a train wreck. Um, so, that's a, like, so that's a result of a tea I really liked, but I couldn't say it's a, it's a, a good tea in the sense of a well-made black tea. On the other hand, maybe you don't like black tea or dark tea, but if you're appraising a tea, you kind of set that aside and you taste the process, the underlying quality. Now, this isn't important if you just drink tea for personal enjoyment, but it's good to know um, if you're trying to appraise and figure out the quality of the given tea. So folks, just before we move into questions, which I see there's a few more popping up. That's why I'm just kind of pausing because I want to just, I'm on the last slide here. Not sure if we're going to make a tea trip in 2021, right? Uh, no one's really sure, but ideally we'll be heading back to China for our annual tea trip. And hopefully we'll be able to share, share a lot of that trip with you right here on our channel. So be sure to, uh, if you haven't already, I know many of you have already, but if you're watching this in the replay, uh, please be sure to subscribe. Um, we have a newsletter that you can subscribe, subscribe to via our website, and that's a great way to stay up to date when we make videos or do get new teas or anything. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you for uh, sticking with me. Um, I had a great time. Um, I want to just uh, remind you, coming up on Sunday is Sunday Tea Book. Uh, we're continuing to make our way through the green teas, coming up soon, dark tea after that. That's been a really fun process. And um, next month, Jen will be doing a presentation. I don't know what it will be yet, so uh, stay tuned on social media for that. I don't know if she's going to tell me. She loves to. I don't know if you saw the video about the uh, the um, the the Banyan uh, Shui Xian, the hundred year Shui Xian that we had. That everybody knew what was going on except me until after. So um, I don't know if I'll know what she's going to do. But next month, sometime in November, she is going to do another one of these. We're trying to do these once a month for you guys to stay in touch and to kind of get out there with you guys in a virtual sense. Right on. Okay, guys. So Cindy, I'm glad you liked that video where I was deceived. <laughs> just kidding. It was really fun. I just, uh, anyway, it was fun. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great night. Thanks for joining me. And until next time, let me see if I can time this right. I got to get my, there we go. Until next time, keep steeping. <laughs>